one. Bingo, surprise! It doesn't look like Carl Campagna, and it isn't, but I like him, and I like his mind. So that's why I'm stepping in as host, and Carl is stepping in as guest. Hi, Carl. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're going to have a good time. Yes. We're going to go fast, though. First, how's your election and your campaign doing? Uh, thank you for asking. It's going very well, actually. Uh, from what I can tell, I've knocked on over 8,000 doors since January. Uh, I have been doing everything possible. I've been sign waving uh, six or seven different places almost every day for the past three months. And the feedback that I've gotten is very positive, very positive. What have you learned? I've learned that the most fun part of campaigning is reaching out to the people, hearing their thoughts, hearing their stories, and being able to incorporate them into a policy agenda. I mean, to, to go with that far. To bring them in. To bring them in and have them be engaged, and how much the people really want to be engaged, yeah. if you ask them. <clears throat> you know, there was a great PBS uh, show, uh, a, a documentary on Sunday, I think it was, involving JFK okay. and his political career. And, you know, he was an underdog for a long time. His father's money and power really didn't help him that much. He had, a, he had to walk the streets himself, and he did, even with his bad back. Yeah. And one of the things that struck me is, uh, you know, his campaign headquarters, there was a sign, you know, vote for Kennedy or something. Uh, but then there were two signs. It says, volunteer, here. Yeah. Come and volunteer. Join me. Yes. You know, and, and the join me thing, I think, is what you're talking about. Yes. It's, it's, it's a philosophical thing, more than a mechanical or a, a strategical thing. Uh, it's, you know, we're together in this. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And, and that's what I was hoping was going to happen and has happened is I was going to go out there, start knocking on doors, and I was going to let my campaign grow organically because that would be a representation of the reality. Mm. And as it has gone, more and more people have engaged, more and more people have donated, more and more people have come out to sign wave and have come to events and are willing to show up in support. And it's just been growing in that way, in a way that is inspiring and then also gives me a greater sense of responsibility uh, to make sure that I am doing everything I can. Yeah. Well, it sounds like not all is lost in Mudville. No. And I say that because I am referring to education in Mudville. Yes. And I consider the population in Mudville on a downhill slide as far as education. Let me wax for a moment. Please. You know, after school and sometimes, well, many times, people don't care about school. There's an anti-intellectual, you know, flavor in the air in Hawaii. Um, they don't care. They don't do well. They don't go on. And, you know, there's a great divide on school. Now, sure, there's uh, Harvard and Yale, but uh, only a few people go there. Most people don't care about it. And what do they get for their, you know, CLE, their continuing education? What do they get? They get the newspaper, which is really not very educational. I'm sorry. It looks for raw meat all the time. Uh, and, and, uh, and, they get, and then they get TV, which is sports, weather, crime, and news. Not news. Uh, sports, weather, crime, and sports. That's what yeah, it is. Exactly. You know, it's a recipe. And, yeah. you know, if you wonder if I'm right, take a look. Any night, any no. channel, that's what it is. No, I agree. So you go through your life, and this is what you get. And this is, you know, you feel fulfilled at 10, 10 o'clock, 1030. But the reality is you're learning nothing about the world around right. you. And then, of course, the media in general, you know, they have the, the Donald Trump show, right? And then there'll be another show. Uh, it's one show after another. It blends. It blends with the reality show and then the reality show. It's all kind of fiction. Right. So <clears throat> what's happening, I think, is that people are, they don't understand their obligation as citizens to be educated. They don't care about education. They don't care about the arts. And little by little, it slides down the hill. You're the kind of guy, I think, in my opinion, you know, that can stop the slide. Um, but, you know, we got to get at the root of things. we got to get at education. That's a primary piece for you. Uh, yes. What is your platform there? Because I have some ideas I want to bounce off you. I'm always open to ideas. I think that, first of all, as a legislator, if I get to be one, it's not just about my thoughts. It's about the community's thoughts. So I want to make sure that that's true. Um, but my position is on education that we need more of it. We need a higher level of education. We need to raise the standards. For education. If we talk about, and forever, for years and years and years, decades, we hear, well, we need to invest in our future, invest in our future. Everyone loves that from a political perspective. It's, it's a great soundbite. We need to invest in our future. Well, what does that mean? To me, it means investing in our kids because they are our future. Give me action. What the action? action there is, okay, when you go through the list of things that are needed for education, we still, to this day, do not have 
all of the teachers hired for this year. So we need to do something to address our teacher We're down by crisis. 636 teachers in the state. Yes. That's incredible that it we is let incredible. that happen. Well, we ha let that happen. It's been ongoing. This isn't just this year. It's an ongoing thing because we don't pay the teachers well enough. We don't treat them like the professionals they are. And we're not recognizing their true value and importance. So that's where, for me, education needs to be higher on the priority list to make sure that we are taking care of our practitioners so that they are taking better care of our children. You know, I'm, I'm a retired lawyer. Um, I'm doing this, and I'm, I'm consumed by this. But suppose I wanted to be a teacher. Yeah. You know, I have a graduate degrees in law, you know. Yeah. Um, and I like kids a lot, and I like to engage with people. But I couldn't be a teacher at Hawaii. You couldn't be technically, or you couldn't be... Technically. I couldn't walk in the door. I couldn't apply for the job. You could apply to be an emergency hire, which is what they're doing uh, right now. That's bureaucratic. I, I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. So that's one of the problems we have. And, and talking about brain drain, I think there's two sides of brain drain with that whole thing. But um, part of the problem there is, yes, we're not actually assessing our teachers correctly. We're, we are not paying them enough so that we don't have the interest to have the higher level people who are available, the higher, better educated. We don't have subject matter experts. We have many cases where our arts programs have been cut, so those art teachers become STEM teachers. And those, I, I think it's great that they're keeping their job. I don't want anyone to lose their job. But what we need to do is reinvest so that we can make sure that we have enough teachers, so that we make sure we have subject matter experts who can inspire our kids. Add to that addressing our deferred maintenance. When we have classrooms that are leaking when it rains. It's a statement. It, it is a statement that education is not important. Yeah. It's low on the priority list. We never have enough money for it. Well, the other thing is, you know, one time I try to get into a school. I try to organize a program, uh, kind of, you know, Bishop Street comes to you sort of thing. Okay. It would have been effortless for the DOE to have people come, business people come from Bishop Street and say hi, share their life stories, sure. share their lessons, share whatever wisdom. Yes. Share themselves, you know, because kids don't really have the opportunity to see. So they can't develop role models on Bishop Street if right. they never meet them. So I said, you know, I try to set it up. I organize a system. They wouldn't have any of it. I said, no, no, no. We, we can't let strangers come into schools. Um, you got to get permission. And we don't have time. And the curriculum takes all our time. And no child, what is it? No child, no child left behind. behind. And, and we, we just have no room for any of this. And we're not going to do it. Never. Yeah. So I say to myself, gee whiz, is that squander? It yeah. is. It's squander. It is. You know, you have the community outside could help in so many ways, and yet it's in an ivy tower of its own making. Yeah. Okay. And then with the with, bureaucracy. With a group of people who are deciding what's good and what's not good, and whether or not they are qualified to do that is a whole other question. And what they're allowed to do and how they're allowed to do it is another question. When we have the No Child Left Behind, which is no longer there, we now have the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is presumably better and we're hoping it's going to be better I still couldn't get in to do my Bishop Street thing I'm not you. not at the moment but that what you're saying there is a vital component of what's necessary and coming up in September I'm going to be attending uh, one of the uh, ESSA events uh, out at um, Moloa High School where it's the community coming together and having a conversation with the board that's been put together to create to recreate to refashion what our educational system can be yeah. within that program one of the important pieces we need is career planning to begin as early as sixth grade i don't know seventh grade That's let's have that idea. discussion let's begin career planning let's let's bring in people from bishop street let's bring in scientists from uh let's bring in everyone possible to be involved in a program to show kids oh by the way here's the application of what you're learning Here's the path of what you could potentially become if you're interested in this area or this area or another. Motivate them. Exactly. Give them something to realize, to see that there's possibility. Gordon Bruce and I, one of our other hosts, you know, this is back in the early days of ThinkTech, maybe 10 years ago. We went to a, a, a program involving um, a sort of a job fair kind of thing for high school kids, okay? And we were teaching tech, you know, we were saying, tech, do tech, it's great for you. It still is. I mean, it's still fabulous. Yeah. And, I, and I would urge it on anyone. It's great. Anyway, so we're, we're pitching tech. And uh, so Gordon decides that, you know, he wants to engage with some kid in the back. And he says, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? The guy says, it's all set for me. I'm going to drive a bus. I said, you're going to drive a bus? What is this? 
How about tech? You know, wouldn't you rather do tech than drive a bus? Honestly, you're here at this conference. He says, no, it's all wired. You know, I got my uncle's cousin, aunt or something, has set up this job for me with the, with the rapid transit company. I'm going to drive a bus. I'm going to make $70,000 a year. I'm going to have all these incredible benefits. I'm going to have a great life. Don't tell me to do tech. That was the end of the conversation. Wow. I'll never forget. Wow. Yeah. I would love to know the follow-up on that to see if he was right <laughs> about any of that. But, you know, yeah. I mean, we, we have a community that doesn't care, you know, to advance education. I, and I, we have I don't education. think that's true. Go, go I don't ahead. think that's true. I think that as I have walked through the district, everybody I talk to, when I start by saying, well, we need to make education better for all of our kids, every person says, I agree. I agree. How do we do that? Well, we do that by making it a higher priority and by making sure that we're bringing more money in in order to fund what needs to be done in the classrooms, for the teachers, and for all of the programming that should be available. So that, across the board, everyone in the community says that's what they want. Okay, how do we get the powers that be to take the steps necessary to actually change it all and make it the highest priority in the state for our future? Yes. Um, for one thing, I want to say I really appreciate Governor Ige's approach thus far with the ESSA program and pulling together a Mr. Daryl Galera as the head of a 19-person team that Governor Ige said, okay, let's not take a look at reforming what this system is. Let's instead clean slate, tabula rasa. What can you do? That's good. How should you make this look, what should it look like? And then let's see how we make that happen. So that is the first very important step. That means the leader of the state is saying, let's make it with the professionals, with the stakeholders, let's make it the best possible. Let's see what that would look like. He's giving you discretion to start from the beginning. Full discretion. But that. can he give you authority? Can he give you funds? Can he give you political buy-in and will? That's the next step. And political will actually comes from the community. And that's where voting matters, first of all, but that's also where making sure that you let your legislators know that this is what you want and how important it is. Uh, so when we have, you know, 30% of the people vote, well, that means 70% of the people are just sort of hoping that things go well. Well, I don't agree with that. That's why I've always been voting. That's why I'm running, because I things need to change for the better. And the only way you do that is by standing up, first of all. So we need more community members to stand up. So if the community shows up and says, no, this is what we want, and that's where I'm inviting everyone to come to Moanalo High School to talk about this, to engage in this, to listen to what, they're what these conversations are, and, and have input. Because that's how you create political will. Because then, once you have that buy-in, once you've had that input, and then once you see how much that's going to cost, then you figure out, okay, that's where the rubber hits the road a little bit. Okay, well, we can't do everything this year. How do we plan this out? How do we phase this out? And through what other means can we bring revenues in to help address it? So, and that's one of the other topics that comes up. We can talk about that if you like. Well, we, yeah, we will. But first, before we go to the break, I just want to ask, where does education fit on your list of priorities? There are so many things that we have to do. Yeah. We could go on for hours, but hours. where does it fit on your list of priorities? It's the number one on my priority list. I've got several things to go through them. Education is the, is the primary one. Um, I go to then to energy and food security issues, which are cost of living issues. I go to housing and homelessness, which are also cost of living, but also how are we actually better taking care of our people that live in the state. Um, and then I've recently been brought into a conversation, which I'm very excited about. I don't know a whole lot about, but I've been asked to participate in prison reform. All of these areas are so important for our people, and they all have commonalities. And that's one of the things that I have learned yeah. as well. Uh, we're going to go to break now. Before we do, I just want to tell you that we have a prison reform program at 11 o'clock on Tuesday with Aaron Wills called Rehabilitation Coming Soon. Really good program. Um, anyway, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. That's Carl Campania. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. 
We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, how you doing? Welcome to Ibachi Talk. I'm here, Gordo the Tech Star on Think Tech Hawaii. And I'm here with my good old buddy, Andrew the Security Guy. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Aloha. Good to, have him, good, to, good to have Andrew here in the house. Please join us every Friday from 1 to 1.30 and follow us up on YouTube. And remember, as we say at the end of every show, how, how you, you doing? doing? <laughs> Quickly. We're back with, with Carl Campania. He's actually the host of this show. And we're talking on a given Wednesday at noon, um, you know, about everything. <clears throat> and one of the things you mentioned, Carl, before we went to the break, which I th I'd like to dwell on for a minute, is prison reform. You know, uh, as part of that show, there's a fellow named Bob Merce, uh, a lawyer. Uh, cares deeply about prison reform. There's a whole bunch of people in the state cared the I didn't. I wasn't aware. And uh, he told me that uh, he's going to make a study of going into O Triple C with a camera um, because he has come to the conclusion that it's in terrible shape physically. You know, we drive by outside. We don't. We don't know. Yeah. We don't get a chance to go inside. Most of us. But if you do go inside, you find out that it's awful, it's run down, it's overcrowded, yeah. it's dirty, it's diseased. <clears throat> All this stuff, you know, it's like the seventh circle in there. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, 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 like, it's like your thing about infrastructure. We kind of begin somewhere. That's a good place to begin. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Yes, OCCC is about 100 years old. It's been there for a long time. Back when it was built, it was the furthest west you would go uh, with with development. It was beyond the city limits. Well, it's now deeply entrenched in the middle of Kalihi with a lot going on around it that's impacted by what this facility is and its age um, as well. So therefore, yes, it is old, it's decrepit, it's an infrastructure problem with costs. Um, as I have asked the question about that, I know for the last couple of sessions there have been conversations about, well, what do we do about OCCC? Should we move it to Halava? One of the questions that is inherent in that is, okay, well, what would that cost if we did that? And if one of the studies that came out that said it was going to cost about 500, it was 500 million or 500 billion, it was some huge amount of money, <laughs> some huge amount of money in order to, to relocate all of the people, the facilities. And it's also important to understand, I recently had a good conversation with Senator Willis Barrow. He let me know, and not, not, all, not a lot of people know, that there's a difference between Halava and OCCC. Halava is a prison for people who are intended to be there for 2 to 20 years. OCCC is a jail for people to be there less than 2 years. Really? Yes. So that was the intention of it, uh -huh. uh, first of all. So mixing the two is not actually appropriate in that regard, if you consider what that means. So, and then another important piece of that whole thing is, well, if it's going to cost an exorbitant amount of money, more money than we actually have in our current $13.5 billion biennial budget, which we know we don't, then what other alternatives are there? And, and that's one of the other questions that should really be explored. What are the alternatives to incarceration? And what situations should we, should we readdress how we imprison people? Yeah, this is like David E. Gates' thing, uh, you, you know, about education. You've got to go back to the beginning and rethink it, reimagine Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You have to have that sort of a fluid, creative, um, uh, completely innovative approach. Yes. And uh, out-of-the-box approach and figure out what to do. But you know, the problem is when you do that, you realize that it's connected to everything else. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, prison reform is related to, you know, people in jail. How did they get there? Why did they get there? What can we do to stop them from getting there? What can yes. we do to rehabilitate them after the fact? Why can't we be more liberal, more understanding, more tolerant? What's wrong with us that we don't appreciate this? How do we train them better so that when they get out of prison, they're ready to go be productive members of society and reduce recidivism? That's one of the challenges as well. So we either just put them in jail and let them out and walk away, or are we are really addressing this from a more holistic perspective? And as soon as I started to learn more about prison reform and what's going on in the whole criminal justice system there, I realized that there are similarities between prison reform 
and those needs from a human services perspective, to Kupuna care and those needs, and to foster care and those needs. I got and it. there it's is about a similarity. Caring. It's about caring. It is all about caring. <laughs> but the, the, the structures and the systems and how they work and, and the services that are needed for the children, for our kupuna, and for our prisoners are actually very similar. If we address it in that way and recognize, and maybe put them in the correct agencies, or make sure that we have services that are being provided. But that goes to one of the other challenges. I mentioned we have $13.5 billion biennial budget. There's not enough money. Every agency that I've spoken to, Department of Transportation, uh, Department of Human Services, go through all of them, uh, DBET, they're all wholly underfunded. What does this mean? I'm sorry? What does this mean? It means, what it means is there's not enough money coming in. We don't have enough money coming in, so therefore there aren't enough people to do the services that are necessary, which means the services aren't being done correctly or efficiently, uh, or enough people aren't being addressed the way they need to be addressed, whether it's uh, someone who needs mental health services, but they're not getting it, a child who needs more care through the foster program so that they can actually get over the hurdle that they have. But you know, it's not only money, Carl. Uh, no. I really offer the thought that um, sometimes we are inefficient in, in how we spend the money. Sure, sure. And sometimes we are inefficient in requiring this spending money, you know, for a given project. For example, yeah, why does it cost so much for land here? Uh, why is it and this, I know this is another show, but why does it cost so much to, um, you know, for a condo for people, uh, for affordable housing? Well, okay. one of the reasons is we have bureaucracy that slows down any contractor. And we have a permitting yeah. process that makes it hard and much more expensive. I can go into that. I have, I have 25 You're a contractor, years. I have 20, I'm not a contractor, but I have 25 years experience in construction project management and development. So what I can tell you, and this is across the board, our permitting process is inconsistent. And there needs to be a change and a, and, and a revision to that. Some of that is more city county based, and I would encourage and will work towards whatever possible in order to make those changes so that there is a consistency through that. And that's one of the problems, is it's inconsistent. And that includes the triggers that require EISs, uh, the environmental impact statements, and other aspects that need to be done. So having a consistency through that program would be a huge help in that direction. You wanna talk about how hard it is to do business here, you want to develop something here, that's one of the challenges, is how do you actually get that done there? So that's one area that needs to be addressed. I've also had the fortune of being able to do both state and federal procurement or involved in contracts that are state and federal oriented. So therefore, I've been able to see a procurement process. The federal procurement process is very specific. The federal acquisition rules are very specific. You need to learn how to be a compliance officer and you make sure that things are being done accordingly. Statewide, we have similar rules, but the way things happen, as soon as you get into agencies, as soon as you get into the Department of Education for that matter, how they do procurement within the Department of Education isn't as clear and it isn't as consistent as it's done in other locations mm. because they're given some rein in how they do this. Mm. Some of that's okay. I want to give people the opportunity to give rein. I don't want to control everything. I want people to be able to do this and create it. But if it's not being done correctly, we need to address it. That's when legislature needs to come in and say, well, please give me your audit of what you do and how you do it and why, because it doesn't seem to be efficient. It doesn't seem to be working. The amount of money that we're giving you isn't actually getting to where we were hoping it was going to get to. So all of these things that we need fixed aren't actually being fixed. So now show me how you do what you do and why. Um, last year, I got to be part, actually for a number of years now, I've been a part of the uh, Farm to School Plus Working Group. At first, I got invited by the Farmers Union, Farmers Union United. Uh, I, I didn't know why I wasn't a farmer, uh, but they brought me in, I sat down, and I realized within a few minutes why it was important for me to be there. And that was because I was the only one who spoke the language that they all spoke, but they all didn't speak each other's language. <laughs> we had the procurement, uh, well, actually, State Procurement Office wasn't even there. We had Department of Education, we had senators, and we had representatives, we had, um, nutrition office, we had USDA, we had the Farmers Union, we had CTAR, we had the uh, um, Farmers Bureau, we had all these people at the table, and they all spoke different languages. So after about 10 minutes of me taking notes, I raised my hand and said, if I may, and they said, please. I said, I've heard around this table, here are five issues that we're facing, five hurdles, in order to overcome this food <clears throat> thing, as far as our schools, prisons, and hospitals are concerned. And 
I'm not sure if all of you were aware of this, but I also listened and I heard that this group is actually trying to address this issue. That group is trying to address this issue, and that one is trying to, to address this issue. There's a couple of other areas that aren't being addressed at the moment, but it would be great if we were to pursue that. And in fact, can we get the State Procurement Office here to talk about what these policies and processes should be? So what's the problem you're describing? Is it, is it that people are in their own silos, advancing their own uh, agendas, and not listening to the other guy, not trying to solve his problem? Um, or is it, um, you know, that there were too many pay players at the table? Sometimes I think, you know, like, for example, in energy, they had this IRP process, mm -hmm. and they allowed, they wanted to have every stakeholder they could think of, well, and they got every stakeholder they could <laughs> think of. Uh, yeah. They had 82 people involved in this process, yeah. and it failed miserably, mm -hmm. okay? And that's going to happen again and again. And, I mean, is it because there's too many people? We don't need that many people. Is it because there's no leader at the top? you know, corralling those people and making them get out of their silos? Or is it because, you know, nobody really wants to address the common, the common issue, that everybody is there in this process? Hawaii, the state of process, you know? I think it's the middle one. I think it's the middle one. I think that without clear leadership and direction to go try something, to go make something happen and work, then things just kind of happen around each other. So if I'm not giving it, you know, if I'm working and I have a boss or three bosses and I'm supposed to do this job and I'm doing this job and I think I'm doing the best that I can, but no one's giving me training, no one's giving me continued training, no one is thinking about what I should be doing or how I should be doing it in a year from now, five years from now, and so on, and I'm just doing this job and no one is providing me with any guidance, I think I'm doing great. Well, you know what? Maybe I'm not doing great. Maybe I'm doing great at this small little piece, but I'm not really considering it because, you know what, I live and I work in a silo. So the silos are a problem, and the more we can integrate, the more we can knock down those walls. And you do that with leadership. You do that with leadership. You do that with leadership, and that's why it's important that we have leaders that will pull people together and say, here, are, what, what are the challenges, or here are some challenges, how do we fix this? How do we get from here to there? I don't want to hear about this, that, and the other, and all of my challenges and problems, un unless there's a solution behind it. You know, I always say leaders require followers. In other words, you can be a great leader, but if people are determined not to follow you, then you can't do anything. That's true. And I think the community has all got to get around this issue that you're talking about. We need leaders. We need to empower leaders. We need to give them authority. We need to follow them. And if we don't do that, we won't have the process of leadership going on. I, I agree with that, except I would revise it this way. We don't give somebody authority and power. They earn it. It's not a matter of, well, you're in that position, so I'll just listen to you. Because how many of us have had bosses that we realize a year into it, we actually know more about this than they do? And we would be better at managing this than they are. So it's not about just that. It's not, a, and I'll also say, it's not about how long you've been doing anything either. Have you been doing it correctly? Have yeah. you been asking the right questions? Yeah. Yeah, it, God, I don't know why, but this reminds me of something in the Navy that I studied when I covered the uh, Ehime Maru incident off Waikiki. Okay. It was called command climate. Okay. In other words, there is a commander, but the commander has to be listening to people. Yes. And people have to try to help the commander. Yes. And it's, got, it's a social compact, a governmental compact. I think we have to re reinvent that here in Hawaii. I think that would be, uh, I think that would be beneficial to rethink how we do our process yeah. to some extent. I Carl, agree. you're terrific. Honestly, well, thank you. I love no, I having these conversations. That. Invite me back. Uh, please, anytime. <laughs> Carl Campania. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Appreciate so. the time. Oh, all right, take care. Hold <laughs> on.